Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Thank you, Karina. That no, uh, such an important message, especially um, right now for um, Oakland and really for the world as we enter into the hottest year yet. And we're dealing with so many um, related problems, interconnecting and intersecting problems. So um, we're really grateful to that vision that she articulated right there. Um, I want to um, welcome everybody um, here tonight. I'm so happy you're here to, to share this time with us um, and share your thoughts. We like to share some of the activities and highlights of our past month. And while a lot is foreshadowed by the events of the last week and a half. Um, there were some really promising and um, heartwarming uh, happenings in the past week we'd like to share with you. Um, here's, first of all, um, we um, participated with many organizations throughout Oakland in the um, Creek to Bay Day program with Adopt a Spot. And, uh, we took um, the opportunity, we noticed, and we um, would like to call, shout out a thanks to the Rotary Nature Center for scheduling a cleanup of the bird pond area that had been choked with um, all kinds of uh, brush and um, also some trash. So um, we encouraged people to uh, go over and help out. And within a morning, a little bit longer maybe, a huge impact was made through the teamwork, collaboration, and the um, energies of volunteers. When you walk by now, it's a different place, and there's a little bit, a little bit of hope there. So um, we're um, we're proud to have done that. We're also um, beginning to um, have school groups um, come to the lake to learn about the water and the um, and the critters and all of that and um, yesterday, we were able to talk to um, Professor um, Amy Borges' um, Biology 1B class at Laney College, and um, they came out, tested the water, um, and took a plankton sample. Um, here we have, yes, here we have um, other activities of recent times. We have a, a table where um, people could check out um, the critters that are uh, at the dock and in the plankton. Um, we've also brought students to the Nature Center um, to see the totem pole and to hear a land acknowledgement. I wish we could share it here. Um, we will sometime um, acknowledging the um, uh, Ohlone people and their, um, their stewardship of the land and the fact that we are here and we appreciate them and they are still here also. And um, so we do that. Then um, we also had um, students coming out to Creek to Bay Day to do water testing. And um, again, it was great to see uh, young people learning about the lake. 
um, one of two of these people have been out um, in the past year with the Rose Foundation programs, and they were able to teach the other um, participants about the lake. Um, and it was really great to see how much they understood and had absorbed. Um, I'd also like to make a final shout out to um, the people who keep their eyes on the lake um, and keep in touch and are able to spot um, problems and uh, relay them to whatever important um, agency needs to hear, for example, about injured wildlife, um, pollution entering the lake, and so forth. It's the concerned citizens that are really important in taking care of our lake and the Nature Center. So um, I want to thank everybody who's donated their time and hung out with us at the lake this month. There we go. And that brings me to um, introduce our guest speaker for the night, Dr. Um, Jim Carlton. Um, so Jim Carlton, it's just such a pleasure to have you here. And um, as uh, he said, he would introduce himself. And I just want to say you've been my hero since I first learned of you somewhere around um, the early 2000s when um, Andrew Cohen came out and talked to my classes at Lake Merritt and um, explained some of your story in connection with the lake. So um, I will um, turn the floor over to you, Jim, if you're ready and um, really appreciate your being with us here tonight. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. How does that look to you, Katie? I think it looks good. Good, all right. Um, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and um, from uh, out here on the East Coast, three hours later, I'm gonna tell you some uh, short stories about um, what we know about extinction in the sea. And um, <clears throat> this is very likely the only lecture you've ever heard about extinctions in the ocean, and uh, maybe the last one. It's not a topic that's covered in uh, any high school or college classes in general. Let me introduce uh, the concept by saying there are different scales and levels of extinction. And uh, these are all common in many ways. Habitat extinction is when a species uh, has disappeared from one habitat but remains in another. An example would be a species that might have occurred in grasslands and a forest and is now just in the forest. Local extinction means that a species has gone extinct from one location, like a bay or a lagoon, but remains in other nearby bays. Regional extinction is a larger stretch of coast. A species might be have gone extinct from uh, Puget Sound to Southern California, but remains in one or two places along that stretch of the coast. And all of these can be related to something called functional extinction, which is that a species could still be around, but the population is so low that its, its role in the community, if it had a historical role as a predator or a competitor, that's no longer the case. It's just too few in number to play a significant role anymore. And commercial extinction is yet a different kind of extinction, which is uh, basically refers to uh, the uh, decimation of a fish population or a hunted population, which uh, has gone to such low levels that it's no longer worth uh, those who are hunting or fishing that species to go out and get the last ones. And finally, global extinction, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight, I sometimes call that the Wicked Witch model, where you're not just dead, you are very, very dead. You're gone from the entire planet. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. <clears throat> there are many examples of populations of species. Some, some of you know those and personally, which have disappeared over the years, but the species we believe remains uh, extant somewhere else. The question that comes up frequently is when do we declare a species as gone? For a long time, there was something called the 50-year rule, which is if you haven't been seen for 50 years, you could be declared globally extinct. As time went by, there were so many exceptions to that, that that was pretty much abandoned. And now there is no universal consensus. Rather, it's a body of evidence 
that has to do with some combination of search effort, uh, the likelihood of discovery or not being able to be found, even if you're there, um, the last time you were seen, and that sort of thing. It's a little more subjective uh, as to what whether a species is truly gone. And part of this is because of what's called the Lazarus effect or also called hospit, which is even if a species has not been seen for an awfully long time, hope springs eternal, that we might found, find it under the next rock in the next field. So under the general aegis of global extinction, I want you folks to think about how many species of marine, ocean-dwelling animals and plants have, been, have become extinct in the past 500 years, basically recent historical time. Now think of a number. Really, I want you to think of a number. For example, how many whale species have become extinct in modern time? Not fossil whales from the fossil record, but how many whale species have become extinct? And we're gonna get back to that question. What I want to show you for the next few minutes are some examples of famous extinctions in the sea. The list is not long. Probably the most famous one and the one you may have heard of is the stellar sea cow. This is a manatee relative. It was 30 feet long, weighed 10 tons. It was a docile herbivore. The last hunted out, uh, last seen in 1768 uh, due to um, uh, Russian hunters. Um, I have to go let a cat out the door. One second, don't go away. I remember I used to have a Halloween costume being a stellar sea cow. Yes, it's it's still rather, <laughs> rather famous. And there are, um, uh, when you go up to Alaska, you can find... Um, you can find um, various artifacts made of, of what is said to be stellar sea cow bones. It was way out here at the very end of the Aleutian Islands on Bering Island, the commander of the Komondorsky Islands in the Western Bering Sea. A huge mammal, um, uh, hard to imagine. It's gone in a real sad loss for diversity. Another great example is a sea mink, which used to live along the New England coast from Cape Cod up to around Nova Scotia last seen around 1880, hunted out. It was probably a recently evolved species since the last glaciation. Likely an important predator. We have anecdotes about it. Surprisingly few, considering the number of people who were around in New England until uh, at that time, but still poorly known. The Japanese sea lion is gone. It was last seen in 1951. It was long thought to be a subspecies of the California sea lion, but later realized to be uh, its own species. There's a stuffed specimen, and it was, it was um, widely distributed in the Northwest Pacific, Japan, um, up to the Kamchatka Peninsula. The West Indian monk seal. When Columbus got to the Caribbean, he reported them by the thousands, and the populations were believed to be in the many tens of thousands. They were... Um, constantly hunted, last seen in 1952. This is a fairly large seal weighing um, uh, between 350 and 375 pounds and eight feet long. There were reports of it um, uh, over the decades since, but the last known specimen seen in the mid 20th century. And that light blue area was the former very broad range of the Caribbean or West Indian monk seal. Among, among birds gone from the world's oceans, this is a penguin-like creature, but not related, called the great auk, stood um, just under three feet tall. It was historically distributed all the way from around Chesapeake Bay across the top of the North Atlantic down to Southern Europe. The last populations were found in Iceland. And when the last two were seen in 1844, they were shot. So that was the story of the great auk. There are specimens uh, in many museums and there's a beautiful coffee table book devoted to it. And here are some other examples of other marine bird extinctions, not very many. 
Um, uh, the Labrador duck was sort of a passenger pigeon of the of the ocean. Uh, Labrador duck was so abundant that it was hunted and common in the Boston markets in the eight, in the eighteen hundreds. And the last ones were seen in 1875. There are some island birds, the merganser in, off of New Zealand, the Canary Island oyster catcher of the Canary Islands out in the eastern Atlantic, um, all mostly gone in the 19th or uh, early 20th century. One would think that with fishing pressures along the world's oceans, we would have had more fish disappear. Only one fish is believed to be extinct, called the smooth handfish. This is not a picture of that species. It was This is a handfish of a different species. Last seen in 1802, last collected in 1802 in Tasmania with a dip net, thus very shallow water. But remarkably, it has not officially been declared extinct. 221 years later, we might ask, what are we waiting for? But this is a classic example of hope springs eternal. Only one seaweed is thought to have been gone extinct. It was found in the last seen 1880s in what was now Sydney Harbor. Um, the modern Sydney Harbor of uh, today does not look like the Sydney Harbor before the 1880s. Um, a highly manicured and urbanized environment, as are many bays and estuaries around the world. So what do we know about marine invertebrate extinctions? Marine invertebrates are most of the species in the oceans. And these include a great many species with which you are all familiar, from sponges and corals to sea anemones, great variety of crustaceans, shrimps, lobsters, barnacles, lots of mollusks, chitons and snails and clams, and oysters, echinoderms like sea stars, sea cucumbers, and so on. There are literally millions of these species in the ocean. And what we know is this. If you can't quite see it, it says almost nothing. Let me show you some examples of what we do know. These are some marine invertebrate extinctions that are, that are thought to be pretty good examples. Very unlikely we're going to see them again. One was a limpet that lived only on eelgrass, zostra blades, over a long distance from Labrador to New York. I'm gonna tell you more about this fascinating story, last seen in 1929. Now there was a mud snail that lived on estuary mudflats in San Diego Bay. Much like Sydney Harbor, the San Diego Bay of history is no longer there. It is a highly engineered, highly altered environment. This mud snail was last seen there in 1935. It's a little tiny snail called Diala, 1870 in a couple of California bays, a sea slug restricted to the blades of a seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon, 1982. And the last one, a sea star, the only sea star thought to have gone extinct in Tasmania, that large island um, below the mainland of Australia in 1991. The last column is when we detected the invasion. Things are getting better, but there's a lag time. And that lag time can be 62 years for the eelgrass, but 132 years before anyone realized that little snail was gone from some California bays, nearly 50 years before it was realized that that snail had not been seen in San Diego Bay. That will become important as we talk a little bit more. Some of those extinct birds and mammals are, um, uh, had parasites. We suppose that those parasites are gone with those birds and mammals. If those parasites were host specific, that said, they've not been found in other birds and mammals that are still living. So we might have a few parasites, five snails, shelled and slug-like, and one sea star. And of the millions of invertebrates, that's the extent of our knowledge of marine invertebrate extinctions. That raises a critical question. Are 
are invertebrates immune to extinction? Is this a, is this a really good record? Is is the, and with those handful of mammals and birds, um, is there something different about the ocean? What I'm going to suggest to you tonight is that there probably is another explanation. And we're going to start with an example of what the potential scale is of what we're missing. And for missing species, what the scientific conclusion might be. So here's a really nice book. It's over 1,200 pages. It's hernia-inducing. It's a beautiful book on the clams and mussels and oysters, the bivalve seashells from uh, Mexico to Peru. And it treats nearly 1,000 species of clams, mussels, oysters, and their relatives, all well illustrated, really a scholarly monograph, designed both for scholars and seashell collectors. I went through all 1,258 pages, and I pulled out the records of species that were last said to be collected in the early 19th century, between 1830s and 1850s, missing species, as it were, um, from this stretch of the coast. And what do the authors say about those species? What do they conclude about why they've not been seen? And as we go through this, I'll remind you <clears throat> that seashells, excuse me, seashells, mollusks, are the best known marine invertebrates in the world. Nothing comes close. And that, of course, is because of seashell collectors. Uh, a, a huge subscription by the public, by what we now call citizen naturalists, to documenting the diversity of seashells. These are not microscopic species unlikely to be overlooked in modern times. Sifting through that beautiful monograph, well, here's some examples of them. Um, standard sort of clam-like, razor clam-like looking species. For some of them, they said they must have been mislabeled, mislocalized, or extra limital. That means they might have come from somewhere else in the world, although they never have been found anywhere else in the world. Some of them are nomen dubia. That's Latin for dubious name and translated in, in other ways, we don't have a clue. And then for one of them, a significant unresolved question. And what do we learn from these statements? What we learn is in no case was it ever suggested that they might be extinct. There is a embedded hesitancy among marine workers to declare something extinct. The idea is that it may be a distribution of biologists phenomenon and not a distribution of species. A corollary to this is that for nearly all the other species, there is no data when they were actually last collected. And if some of them or many of them had not been seen for a hundred years, you can't tell that from the entries in this book or many similar books. Here's an interesting story that comes from workers on coral reefs. And it's a sobering story. Marjorie Rieke at the University of Maryland um, uh, did some simple calculations based upon what we call um, uh, island biogeography and species curves, which is you relate the size of an area to the number of endemic species. It's been done with tropical forests and lots of other habitats around the world. And she applied that model to coral reefs. And she said, let's assume that 95% of the world coral reefs are um, still in good shape. 5% are degraded. Unlikely, of course, it's probably closer to a quarter of the world's coral reefs are somewhat seriously degraded or not in their former state. And from those calculations, she did a simple, simple deduction, as has been done for tropical rainforests, that over 1,000 already described species have gone extinct. And by using these area density of species curves, that more than 50,000 undescribed species have become extinct because of the loss of only 5% of coral reefs. That calculation, that type of calculation, 
drove a great interest in biodiversity starting in the 1970s and 1980s with the loss of tropical rainforests. And when, when it was announced that we were losing one insect species every hour, this, this stimulated a huge interest in general diversity and biodiversity issues. What was the reaction to Rieka's calculations for coral reefs as opposed to tropical rainforests? The reaction is that nobody believed it. It didn't have the same subscription at all as with tropical rainforests. And what was the challenge with that? Why not? Nobody could point to a single extinction. If such extinctions had happened, surely, surely they would have been pointed out. It was simply hard to believe. It was again, hope springs eternal, that that simply couldn't be the case. And that goes to another assumption, that if in the ocean we had relatively large and common species simply disappear, not in the deep sea, right in shallow water, in a few feet of water, we would know about it. The public might say they would know about it. And of course, the question is, who is they? And the question is, can we make this assumption? And I'm going to I'm going to rephrase that. How closely do we monitor and see changes in biodiversity in the coastal zone? And by this, I mean tide pools. I mean things wrist and elbow deep, things that are right along the coast and under our very eyes. Could species disappear and no one would say anything? I'm going to go back to our little eelgrass limpet here, um, about half an inch long. It, it lived in wrist deep water on floating eelgrass blades along all the New England coast up to Canada, uh, very abundant. In 1929, one collector reported that he, they collected thousands of them on an eelgrass metal wading around up to their knees on a main coast. The last specimens were collected in 1929. But here's what happened. For the next 60 years, every seashell book and seashell guidebook in New England said it was common on eelgrass blades, and no one had ever seen one since 1929. It was then announced in 1991 that that was the case based upon a thorough exploration of historical museum collections and field work. But it told us that in fact, something extremely common along the coast had disappeared and no one had ever mentioned it. This is a shrimp that some of you may know. It's about six inches long. It's called the mud shrimp. It creates these lunar-like habitats along uh, much of the Pacific coast. If any of you took a biology or a marine biology course in, in uh, uh, school, this is one of the fun species we used to go out and collect on intertidal flats and bays and estuaries all along central California. It was a classic species in biology classes on a, an adventure of marine biology field trips to go try to dig one out in two or three feet of mud and, um, and, and find one of these magnificent mud shrimps. Between the 1980s and the 2010s, it steadily disappeared. Over a period of 30 years, this is not a microscopic species, no one said anything. When I talked to various people about this, my colleagues over the years, they said, well, maybe it goes through population fluctuations, or they would casually say they hadn't seen one for a while, but it simply disappeared, entirely vanished in many, not all, bays and estuaries. What happened, and this is the work of John Chapman and his colleagues up in Oregon, a parasitic isopod from Japan was introduced by ballast water is a blood-sucking parasite that causes castration, so that's a highly negative thing. 
and populations began to collapse. This is a very colorful sea slug uh, called Hypsilodorus californiensis. Um, not huge, not three or four inches long, but still a decent size. Very colorful, common to abundant on the California coast, Southern California in the early to mid 20th century, last seen in 1977 at Eat Sponges. It still exists out on the California islands, but despite being very common along the inter in tide pools, no one mentioned it had disappeared until the year 2013. As we go through these stories, I want you to think about all the tiny stuff, the little worms, the little crustaceans, the sponges, the hydroids, the bryozoans, a vast array of tiny species that are not on this level of radar. And to wrap up these series of stories in San Francisco Bay. This is the native horn snail, Cerithidia, now called Cerithiopsis, Cerithidiopsis californica. And this is a reconstruction of where it was in San Francisco Bay. It's a nice little snail, it's an inch long. Um, uh, based upon old museum and literature records, it was actually first found in 1841, way up in the Sacramento River. It's not a habitat we think of for this snail now, but it was clearly abundant, large collections uh, up in uh, Richardson Bay, Mill Valley, a little town called Manzanita, no longer really there, a stop on a, a, stop on a stagecoach. Um, other places along the East Bay and down in the South Bay, Many of these sites, when we look at them as plotted in 1912, 1921, 1913, when we plot them on a modern map, although the dots are shown on the shore, in fact, superimposed on a map of the time, they are now under the highways and under the streets. So the exact locations don't exist. How abundant was it? We think there were millions of them on the mudflats all around San Francisco Bay. And here's a collection of them made in Lake Merritt in 1877, when there were large mudflats at low tide spread out, something hard to imagine now in the lake before it was walled off and highly controlled. This is just one population of them collected by a famous old-time conchologist and professor Josiah Keep at Mills College. Wrote a number of books about seashells of um, San Francisco Bay and Monterey Bay, well-known at the turn of the last century. Now you can guess what I'm going to say. It was largely gone by the 1950s, and there is not a single published word about that that this extremely abundant snail, millions on the mudflats of San Francisco Bay, there are a few populations still uh, in the South Bay, but there is nothing about its former abundance in an area with a high density of marine biologists, long studied by biologists, and an interesting story then that links back to this thread of stories about our finger on the pulse of what's on the coastal zone as we go across different generations. So a conclusion that we might make from this relative to, are there very few extinctions of marine species in the sea, is that it's really easy to miss that abundant and common species can disappear without a comment. And there could have been abundant species in the 1700s and 1800s. They're just gone. We had no idea. No one ever mentioned it. They fall off and disappear from the record. Many of these may actually be overlooked in museum collections or in older forgotten literature. This is a major and compelling field of study based upon our modern evidence that many species can go unreported and their abundance, just they can just disappear. 
we would estimate that in fact, there may be many species that have disappeared, but it gives a sense that in the sea, very little has gone extinct, which may not be correct at all. Let me end with this, which is, why do we care about species that have gone extinct? Um, a lot of work is done these days on what are called threatened and endangered species. There's a lot of work on that. We try to assess who's dangling on the edge, who's near extinction, who can we protect, how can we protect them? Let me offer you some ideas about why we should care about understanding what's actually may be gone. The loss of distinct species and lineages are fundamentally interesting from an aesthetic, cultural, and scientific point of view. Extinct species also tell us what kinds of species are vulnerable. And they also tell us what types of communities and ecosystem, ecosystems are vulnerable to the loss of species. And this is called shifting baselines in community ecology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is it possible that in many modern communities that where you're studying, there are key regulatory species, what we would call ecosystem engineers, that are, are in fact gone. And we just don't know that. And we study the community as if it's intact. Is that possible? Yes, it is. And what about those whales? I asked you that question at the beginning, and the answer is, and you may wonder, why can't I think of one? No modern living whales <clears throat> are known to have gone extinct. Not yet. Some species are in very small populations, <clears throat> but so far, we've not lost any of the big or small whales. And so we'll end with that on a positive note. Thanks, guys. Happy to talk and answer questions. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, Robin points out that the um, Jeff Godar was the one who worked on this, um, uh, mm -hmm. and it did re it did reappear, but but it's um, it's long it's long absence really, and the fact that people didn't notice it for a long long time is really the message. Hospit is um, isn't always without merit by any means. You know, we hold on. It's also called the New York Times phenomenon. Is the name of Hospit or the Lazarus effect? which is that about once a year in the New York Times, there's a little note on the front page that says um, a bird, a reptile, something thought extinct for 150 years has been rediscovered. So that's some of the basic hesitancy to declare species extinct. Um, that, that hesitancy about known species is one thing. What we think is going on in the marine invertebrate world is that um, when we look at all the groups that, that are really difficult to assess, um, all the small invertebrates, the soft body invertebrates, that a great many of those have, may have disappeared, giving us a sense uh, that there are fewer extinctions in the sea than there really are. But thanks, Robin, for pointing that out. Um, Roger Newman. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about sort of um, large scale phenomenon and what um, effect they could have. In particular, I'm thinking about the uh, global warming and the acidity of the world's oceans. I mean, I know people uh, cry wolf over all this stuff, but uh, and maybe your data don't show it yet, but uh, are you optimistic in that area? Well, it's um, it certainly is one of the great challenges of um, climate change in terms of of uh, what's happening to populations, uh, both in low latitudes, tropical populations where things are getting warmer and warmer, and what their refuges are, if there are any, especially among coral reef species, um, and then um, what's happening at higher latitudes as well. What's happening, and I think almost all of our folks on the chat know it tonight is that a great many species, really thousands of species, in all the in all the great habitat realms, marine, freshwater, and terrestrial, are moving poleward. The biological expansion of the Earth is one of the greatest signals of climate change. Um, along 
where I am along the Atlantic seaboard. In the south, it's called Caribbean creep. A lot of Caribbean species are moving north. Up here in New England, it's called Chesapeake creep, where we have a lot of species that historically stopped hard stop at Chesapeake Bay, are moving into New England. Uh, and these are not one-off occasional species. These are populations that are now permanently established. So there's this huge climate-induced expansion of species. And what that will mean for these resident species that are facing these waves of, of what essentially are invasions of species, um, really hard to tell. We're just on the beginning edge of understanding that. And what it means to your very question, what it means for those tropical populations, which are going extinct at the other end and may not find proper habitat as they move north, that's an, uh, an excellent question. Um, this is one of the um, most prominent and eyebrow raising things that we are watching. But um, And while we are watching a lot of the species that are moving north or south in the southern hemisphere, we have surprisingly little data about what happens with the populations at the other end that are retreating. Uh, we do know, however, some, some reports like in the Iberian Peninsula of Southern Europe, Portugal and Spain, that many colder water species have simply disappeared and have, are, have moved north. Which of those populations have disappeared and not moved north? Not so clear. It's an important question. From Anthony, we have uh, how many of these species that became extinct were keystone species? What happens when a keystone species becomes endangered or extinct? Or is it not possible? Um, what do they call the lobsters along the New England coast migrating north into Canada? Coastlines. A um, couple of questions there. Um, uh, we know um, for the species that um, that we um, know, the large mammals like the sea cow, um, uh, and some of the birds, like the great auk, um, they were gone before we knew what they were doing in those communities. Uh, and so uh, very likely in their size or their abundance, they were important predators. Certainly the sea cow must have had a certain, uh, must have had an ecological footprint there. But uh, rarely do we know uh, where what they were doing in the community because they were gone before the first biologists showed up. Um, lobsters are um, lobsters have largely disappeared in southern New England. The great lobster fishery is gone. It's just too warm. Um, most lobstermen are out of business down here in Long Island Sound and Fish Island Sound. Some of you are familiar with that. And um, and a cascade of that, as a footnote, is that there are thousands, and some estimate tens of thousands, of abandoned lobster traps on the floor of Long Island Sound. And there's now a major retrieval program trying to get those out. I got confused when you were discussing invert invertebrates and yeah. their yeah. disappearance. And then it seemed to me, when you first began discussing it, that they were there were a fewer a few uh, invertebrates that had gone extinct, but then later you mentioned that there was this question of whether or not they are, are immune to extinction. So that was the confusing part for me. Yeah, um, when one when we look, thank you, David. When we look at the list of acknowledged extinctions, extremely few. Um, the, even the, the nudibranch I mentioned is not an example of an extinction, um, uh, example of, of detection. Um, and, um, and the conclusion is in the, in the current literature that, um, that um, very likely that most invertebrates are not, in, not likely to become extinct because after 150 or 200 years of study, um, this tiny handful of species have been reported as extinct, uh, and um, and not even all, not all of them are, are officially recognized yet. So, a logical conclusion is that surely we would know if more had gone extinct. The reason we went into the stories about how common species can decline 
in some cases reappear, certainly, but decline and be missed is because I think that's strong evidence that, in fact, a great many have become extinct and we simply do not know. So clarification, um, uh, we could conclude that uh, that there are not many invertebrate extinctions, but I think um, I think the evidence suggests otherwise. And um, and as a corollary to that, I have essentially no colleagues who study this question. It's a very quiet field. It simply is not compelling for modern students to go into the vast museum collections and rummage around to see if they can find species that have not been reported for 200 years. It's just not part of the training we have. And so that does not have a positive feedback into, into, into digging deeper into these questions. Um, let me, I see another couple of questions. Has an academic specialty developed toward updating records of species who haven't been seen in a long time? Um, uh, in the marine environment, no. Um, it is an active field on, on land and terrestrial uh, situations, less so in freshwater, but uh, not so much in the ocean. Um, are other auk species still living? People who visit Finland and Norway report seeing auks. Not clear. Yeah, all, yes. Uh, the great auk is is gone. There are living auks for, for sure. Um, is DNA monitoring being used at all for hard to monitor invertebrates that are prone for extinction events? Um, um, eDNA, which Damon mentions, is a is a uh, modern technique to uh, look for uh, genetic signatures of uh, species, um, which uh, we might not even be able to find them uh, exactly, but they leave their DNA trace in the water. Um, uh, Damon, not that I know of. Um, uh, a lot of eDNA now, um, a lot of application is to look for invasive species, to detect invasive species either in small numbers or if there's a trace of them in the area and that sort of thing. So, but not not yet for um, uh, potential extinction events in the ocean. Yeah. All good questions. Yeah. Oh, Jim, um, we had a question. Um, I can't see the name now about um, the effect of microplastics. And I know you uh, gave a lovely talk about plastics in the ocean. Is that um, have yeah. not been given to or there's a sense of how they may exacerbate um, extinction of invertebrates? Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Um, uh, no, that relationship has not been established. Um, microplastics are certainly um, just an overwhelming issue. Um, and um, there are hundreds of papers now published uh, uh, every month on microplastics in the sea um, and in our food and in the air, uh, but not yet linked to that that good question about whether they could exacerbate impacts on populations to the point of, of causing extinction. Um, but um, a lot of those kinds of impacts and how they insinuate themselves deep into uh, ecosystem dynamics, not yet, not yet well understood. Good question though, thank you. Um, If Robin is still with us, um, Robin, do you know of any any other records of nudibranchs or sacroglossins that have not been seen for a long time? Have you spotted any of those? Not sure Robin is still with us. Okay. Jim, are there any ecological um, approaches or if there if anyone's interested in this topic? Hi, Jim. Have... Sorry. I oh, go was... ahead. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Robin. Um, this is Robin <laughs> answering your question. Sorry, was a little bit twisted around. I'm doing this on my phone. Uh -huh. um, there are a couple of species of uh, nudibranchs and sacoglossins, at least in the California Oregon, Washington area that haven't been seen for a long time. Um, most of them are small and hard to find. Um, so that may be part of it. 
They have been lurking there for a really long time. They're small and beige. They hide deep in the mud flats. Um, we recently had a squad from the San Diego Nudibranch community on iNaturalist go out and find a rare sack of glosin. In fact, they found quite a few of them. Got uh, horribly filthy and muddy at uh, two in the morning, but they were successful. So, yes, um, it's just a matter of people being willing to get out there and look. And uh, definitely kudos to that group for <laughs> getting out there and doing it yeah so um having the list i think um is part of the attraction for uh amateur scientists uh particularly on iNaturalist to get out there and find something that uh, hasn't been seen for a while yeah i totally I totally agree um and that really is something i meant to mention which is that um uh our eyes uh uh, on the coastal oceans really are in large part now by citizen scientists, by by naturalists, um, uh, whatever field of endeavor they actually work in for a profession, they may be out there looking at the coastline uh, and uh, vast, <clears throat> vastly more than professional scientists or marine biologists. And, um, I've long mentioned that you can spend a long time at the beach and you will never meet a marine biologist, but we have a lot of good folks out there. And the evolution of my naturalist has been tremendous. It's, um, it is really an amazing resource to document uh, diversity and um, does a really good job of trying to get accurate identifications and engage the community about whether an identification is correct or not. So it's a marvelous resource and, and, um, uh, often a step ahead of what professional uh, biologists um, actually know from their own own uh, research. I think what a lot of us citizen scientists really appreciate too, though, is the fact that many scientists are on iNaturalist and generously giving their time to yeah. helping us learn and helping us with our identifications of things that we see. So that partnership has been absolutely fantastic for people like myself um, who use iNaturalist as a learning tool. Yeah, good point. And it is global. We should mention that. Um, this is a global database, um, which is, which is uh, great. A lot of the new invasions that we track are more easily tracked on iNaturalist than, um, than by our own sampling programs. Good point. Just to put in a plug, um, we've been um, having a number of um, uh, bio blitzes and um, biodiversity day we participated in at Lake Merritt. There's still stuff there at Lake Merritt to look at to see how populations may change in regard to um, some of the um, environmental changes that we've experienced even in the past you know, several years. Exactly. Yeah. We are going to be um, producing a calendar again this year. Just wanted to um, keep your interest. It's going to feature speakers, um, I believe, including Jim uh, from our previous Lakeside chats with photos and some information and how you can uh, review that. We have um, uh, Karina Gould and we also have um, Andrew Alden um, signed up for that. It's going to be a beautiful calendar. I want to thank everyone for coming and invite you to come again in November um, when we're going to be hearing from Dr. Andrew Car uh, Cohen um, about uh, oysters in San Francisco Bay and a mystery. So we want to thank uh, uh, Jim Carlton, Jim Cobell, our Rotary Nature Center uh, friend staff, Lake Merritt Boating Center, the Lake Merritt Institute, Oakland Adopt a Spot, Team Oakland, New Voices, uh, Volunteers, um, Major DD people, and the California Climate Action Corps fellows, and all of Oakland for participating in our um, work and studying the lake, and enjoying the lake. Coming up, Lakeside Chat number 36 is going to be on November 3rd, and we'll send out the um, invitation with the event bite um, 
link on it. Um, we have an adopt a spot workday, um, official third Saturday workday coming up on the 21st. Um, and if the um, Rotary Nature Center is also hosting a um, event, we would um, look people to um, help out there as well. Um, what else? Oh, Autumn Lights. This may be sold out at this point. But um, that Autumn Lights Festival is from October 12th to the 14th. And um, there is the link for that, which I can open put in the chat. Okay, if you enjoy what we do, um, the lectures, you will enjoy looking at the activities of um, young people, old people, and participation of um, citizens in science, uh, community in science. Um, consider supporting us with a donation. Um, we have a website um, uh, <clears throat> that you can go to with a donation button. And um, your donation helps to um, provide uh, equipment, supplies, and um, so forth to keep our program going and um, improving. Um, here's our website. Um, Rotary Nature Center friends, and we'll put that in the chat or we will send in our next um, email to you with the link. Um, our lakeside chats are rebroadcast on um, KTOP um, Channel 10 TV, City of Oakland. Um, the first two Saturday, Sundays of the month from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, feature um, Golden Oldies, um, and the last two will feature the um, Lakeside chat of that month. We want to thank um, a, a number of people who have been especially helpful to us. Our producer, Rob Ramon. Um, Kristen Furman does art and design. Janice, Betsy, Patty Donald. Um, many, um, many uh, volunteers that come out and work with us. Um, Oakland um, and the Youth Employment Partnership. Lake Merritt Rowing Club has been a champion getting us out to test the water in the lake. Um, San Francisco Elks Lodge number two. Um, the Heart Foundation for Educational Opportunity. And it goes on and on. We really appreciate everyone who is supporting our efforts uh, to provide um, and program at Lake Merritt. And that could be the end. Um, so we are an independent 501c3 nonprofit, um, a citizens group. We all work for free and we are passionate about um, learning about Lake Merritt and including everybody in enjoying and learning. And um, so we have um, all of these activities going on. And if you're interested, please shoot us an email. Um, my email uh, will be in the chat or um, it will be available. So um, with that, I would like to bring the formal program to a conclusion at this point, and thank you so much for your participation. We will reopen. Thanks, Katie. Uh, the night is young. It's only 11 o'clock here. <laughs> okay. So I was wondering if there were, like, you could look at um, certain human activities um, if that could lead you certain sorts of organisms that might be a good place to look for disappearances. I mean, for example, like, well, Lake Merritt, you know, was a mud flat and now it's not. Um, so you might expect that certain species that were in some kind of a um, balance at that time for a long time would be out of balance and might be candidates for disappearance. Is that one approach that people take? Yeah, we talk a lot about, thank you for that, Katie. Uh, we talk a lot about um, uh, habitat um, uh, extirpation and decimation. Um, and especially when we look at older maps of the coastline and realize the extent of the bays and estuaries and the mudflats and the um, seagrass habitats that used to be in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 1800s, uh, perhaps no better example than um, uh, the mapping of Southern California uh, in the 1800s, really vast extents of lagoons and, um, and, and back bays and estuaries. 
and the modern size of those is just a fragment of what what we now see and of course much of that is under freeways and uh under uh, under the fill so um we expect that it's those kinds of habitats um that were um have been very vulnerable to the loss of populations um and san francisco bay is no exception to that um and we see that really in all the major um embayments and estuaries of, of North America, Puget Sound, the bay systems of Central California, the bays and sloughs of Southern California, um, Chesapeake Bay, Long Island Sound, so on. Um, Boston, for those of you who know the Boston area, an 18th or 19th century map of Boston is not recognizable compared to modern Boston since um, much of Boston is now uh, under soil much of the original Boston, um, Fenway Park, famous sports um, uh, arena, um, was built on the fens of Boston, the marshes, Boston. Yeah, so um, that's a suspicion that with those, with the loss of that extensive habitat, we may well have lost a number of species, which like the famous extinct but never seen insects of a tropical rainforest. They never have been collected in the first place. Um, what's fascinating to think about is that, going back to Marjorie Rieka's model, is that there was a huge buy-in for that, um, what were these island biogeography curves for losing insects in tropical rainforests, and and no one doubted it, that, that the number of endemic insects by loss of acreage in tropical rainforests really resulted in actual extinctions. We never saw those insects. We never collected them. They were just gone. But that model applied to the ocean did not have subscription, which was fascinating. Any last thoughts, folks? Um, you know, always happy to, to chat outside this venue. Yeah. Well, um, please, if there's I just anyone- want to be yes. clear that- uh, David. Uh, I wanted to be clear that when um, for those species that are we believe may be gone and may have been gone before we started collecting, how do we have today any data on that? That all comes from the eDNA. Is that that's what I'm thinking? So, um, uh, what your question, David, is how how do we know who's gone if we never never had them in the first place or that kind of thing or well if we want to sort of identify that they are now gone yes or they disappeared before we started collecting yeah the process for that would be the edna not really um the process for that would be um for the best excavation of those records is to go back into the vast museum collections and look for species that were last collected in 1850, but no one has noticed that they were last collected in 1850. Um, that is a largely unsubscribed field. Um, and the ones we have noticed, like the famous limpet, was a perfect example of that. It was last collected in 1929. We explored all museum collections looking for anyone who found it after that date, and there were simply none. And that was easy. That was low-hanging fruit, but no one had ever done that. So really, um, uh, what's in the museums of the world may be one of our best records of what is now gone. Well, I had heard of a tunicate that was migrating south rather than north. Have you heard of that? And it was uh, poking its um, nose into San Francisco Bay. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a Corella, Corella inflata. Um, and it was a surprise to us because it is a, um, it is a cold water species. And um, we published on that coin um, in a paper called Going Down the Up Staircase. Uh, yes. And um, most species are moving north. Um, in the northern hemisphere or moving south in the southern hemisphere. There are a few cases where species uh, are recording, are recorded to move move um, to the south, and these are generally a mystery to us uh, as to what's going on um, and whether they are 
transiently established because of um, dips in the temperature or what it might be, but no really good explanation for those. Since, uh, but they are they are uh, less than the one percent. Um, newly introduced species move north and south to their mm -hmm. physiological range, so that's not not part of the question. But a few of these do pop up, and they um, they get us wondering about why they have not moved historically before to their southern range. There could be mutations um, um, uh, such that we have populations that um, have changed uh, their uh, temperature tolerance. There are a few possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a rare that's a rare one. Yeah, a, a very well known sea squirt whose southern range was basically Puget Sound. Then, but then it popped up in some bays to the south. Yeah. Layla has a question. It's in the chat. Unless wow. Layla can just ask. Oh, still... good question, Layla. Um, uh, she asks, how do harmful algal blooms like the one at Lake Merritt and much of the Bay Area experience last year lead to extinction of marine animals? Yeah, I can I can uh, uh, talk about that uh, uh, briefly. L Lila, they could lead to the extinction of local populations, um, but not likely, so far as we know, to global extinctions of species, so that the species is taken out from the entire planet. Um, uh, a footnote about that, which does not come up in uh, many of the recent discussions of HABs um, uh, in San Francisco Bay, is that some of those HABs might actually be non-native species. And, um, and they're not necessarily the blooms of native uh, phytoplankton, uh, diatoms and dinoflagellates, but could be, um, um, could be uh, invasions, uh, either new invasions or invasions of new genetic stocks of species that are already here. One of the things we've observed um, in San Francisco Bay is that um, although we know that there are now somewhere around 300 non-native species of animals and plants in the greater Bay Area, up to the Delta and down to the very bottom of the South Bay, um, there are no recognized, agreed upon, introduced phytoplankton. Um, microscopic uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates, and a host of other uh, unrelated um, uh, small protist-like um, uh, organisms. Um, despite the fact that there are nearly 500 different species of broadly speaking phytoplankton in the bay, not a single one is recognized as introduced. And that's a, something we talk about in the invasions community a lot. Um, uh, and the assumption is that some of those are introduced, uh, and it's just a matter of trying to uh, recognize and sort out which ones, which ones are are native and which ones are introduced. We also have, as many of you know, a lot of species in the bay where we don't know if they're introduced or native. And those are cryptogenic species, and there are a lot of those. So, and it's in a, it's among those phytoplankton that we suspect that there are a lot of um, cryptogenic species uh, that we don't know whether they were naturally here. Ballast water from around the world has been arriving in San Francisco Bay since the 1890s, so well over 100 years, releasing hundreds and hundreds of species of phytoplankton from all over the world. I personally think it's hard to believe that not none of them <laughs> have been successful here. So um, I expect that we are underestimating that fraction of the non-native biota. That was a tangent well off the harmful algal bloom question. I have a comment. It seems that in the course of history, the that there's some synergy or um, uh, what's that other word? Correlations between the um, time when we arrive at this in the 1800s with this proliferation of uh, biologists, as well as at the time when we arrive at a level of uh, technology 
um, that allowed us to have a, to do what we have been doing all along. And this is uh, kind of how it comes together in my mind. We, you know, when I say we humans kind of uh, started harvesting uh, a number of uh, plants and uh, species and, and, and animals. And then as the te technology uh, advanced, like in the whaling industry and others, you know, we were able to uh, collect a lot more, a lot faster. And it seems to have coincided with this proliferation with biologists, although not soon enough in, in terms of our awareness of our impact. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's lots of layers there. Um, you know, the whole field of marine biology, pretty much as a formal field, doesn't really get going into the late 1800s. We're hardly 100 years into that. Um, and so um, we know um, we know remarkably little about a great many communities before, and I, I'll broaden this to just not marine biologists, but any biologist on any any any, any habitat. Um, so a lot of what we need we have not done is reconstruct what many habitats used to look like, many areas before um, before we began heavy um, uh, European colonization. Uh, heavy urbanization, industrialization, modifying the seascape and the landscape. So, um, and an amazing amount of our so-called baseline data is created long after the um, the uh, hand of man has been active in many areas. And so we are aware that this is called the shifting baseline. What is natural, which would be an interesting lakeside chat at some point um, is a topic of common conversation as to as to when we set the baseline <clears throat> for when change began. But um, and I don't think we've talked about shifting baseline very much in the lakeside chats. This may be a tangent to, to your point, David, but um, uh, very often we do not appreciate the scale of change um, uh, uh, compared to what we think what we perceive the change to be. So for many of us, um, um, and I'll just wrap up with this observation, for many of us, um, what is natural um, was our childhood and or the childhood of our parents or grandparents. And that's about as far back as it reaches. And I'll give you an example, which is we have a lot of, uh, in um, a lot of programs, uh, to restore, restore Long Island Sound, restore Chesapeake Bay, restore the Great Lakes. And if you get on all those websites, you will not find a target date of restoration. Restore to what year? And usually it's the childhood of the people who founded the organization. They're lamenting their childhood. What the world should look like is when you grew up, and that's mm. what you lament. And so, um, which is a pretty pretty shallow kind of way to look at history. But for a lot of restoration programs, what date will you choose? Does the world should the world look like it was in 1923, 1623, 1023? What we challenge our students with is, what date would you pick, and how would you defend that date? If you're in the restoration ecology, as many of you know, is a huge field. There's a there are journals of restoration ecology. This is a this is a this is a big field, conservation biology. Um, but it it rests upon rather um, jello-like knowledge of what the world used to really be like, um, because we were moving around the world, humans long before there were any scientists who were documenting biodiversity. Um, and that goes back, of course, tens of thousands of years. So I find that fascinating in many ways. Let me quickly share how it came up for me. I was watching an old film, black and white film, I, set in the London of the late 17 or early 1800s. 
mustard. And uh, a woman received a hat with a feather. The feather was from a bird, and these were very popular. And uh, but as I was watching the movie, I, I was thinking to myself, "Oh my goodness, who would want to sacrifice a bird just for <laughs> the fashion of the hat?" Um, and that's what uh, started me on that train of thought last night. With with the, my quick answer was, well, someone who did not realize the impact that yeah. would occur or could occur um, under the circumstances. This is a whole amazing topic. There are there are, uh, lots of um, environmental historians have looked at this. Um, uh, historians of the natural world in terms of when we began to harvest nature and all the things that the so-called great European expeditions fanning out across the globe starting in the 1700s would haul back to the European theater uh, and, uh, and just how much they were they were collecting nature, as it were. And um, that's an amazing and uh, often a sad story. The um, Caribbean monk seal was partly decimated by scientific expeditions because you know, that odd thought that um, a species is disappearing, so we better go get the last ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I believe the Cal Academy nearly um, killed off elephant seals, um, and they um, they shot when they found a pocket of them. They shot and saw all of them, and some of their carcasses are in the um, in the California Academy. Yeah, Galapagos tortoises, Galapagos tortoises as well. Um, mm -hmm. yep. um, harvested by a lot of harvested by a lot of scientific expeditions. <clears throat> there really wasn't a good sense in the uh, no sense at all in the 1700s and or surprisingly limited in the 1800s about what it meant to um collect a lot of stuff and not to really be concerned about the size of the population uh, the reverse was true we we and someday we'll have another lakeside chat about the intention the scale of um intentional introductions that were made in the 1800s around the world, which is an mm -hmm. amazing story. We don't do that much anymore, um, uh, but a um, um, uh, hundred years ago, um, all the cool kids were moving species all over the world and the, the uh, ethic there was to improve nature. Now we would not do that. If I said to those few of us who are left here, I've got an idea. I'm going to take a three foot long carnivorous fish from the Atlantic Ocean and throw it in San Francisco Bay just to see how it would do. And maybe we could establish a new fishery. Today, there's not a new enough paper in the world to write the environmental impact statement. But that was what was being done in the 1800s. And as a result, we got the striped bass and the striped bass is part of our iconic fishery along this coast. So it's a part of our recreational fishery and, and well, well embedded culturally, as it were. But that's something we would never, ever do today. Um, but that's a tangent to <clears throat> harvesting nature. We were going around and moving species around. An amazing, the U.S. The US Fish and Wildlife Service, that's the new name, Back then, it was just the Fisheries Bureau um, had railroad cars called fish cars <clears throat> to sprinkle fish all over America. That's a that's an amazing story. Yeah. Again, we wouldn't do that today. <laughs> I just wonder if um, I know that there's been a lot of talk about the um, the sturgeon and the impact of the hab. Um, whether that is likely to lead to probably local extinction, but um, it seems like it would, there was a, such a, a, a huge devastation, um, and we still we still don't know what the um, environmental conditions are that um, 
would the escape of this species happen? See that there's so many components. I'm wondering about uh, rates, uh, how if anybody follows um, the genetics of these species, especially something like a, a phytoplankton, like, you know, it has millions, bazillions, millions of individuals all reproducing um, yeah. and genetically not necessarily identical because we have mutation at any rate, they have sexual reproduction. Um, how is evolution um, proceeding in some of those, um, those situations? Yeah, good question, both for extinctions and invasions. Um, uh, um, and a lot of work being done in many of those fields and mm -hmm. questions about um, how are non-native species are genetically distinct and are they um, undergoing microevolution to be distinct from their parental populations, things like that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> but back to your point about the sturgeon and um, the fate of a number of our species in San Francisco Bay. Um, you know, the bay is a classic model for trying to separate out what happened to its biology uh, because there were so many different drivers of change. And those are, are it's, it's such a multi-parameter system it's very hard to figure out why certain things have changed. Uh, <clears throat> what happens <clears throat> when you introduce hundreds of species into the bay? But the bay, the bay of 2023 is not the bay of 1823. We know that, uh, or 1923, and so it's hard to capture the scale of change. You, many of you, know that um, the Coast and Geodetic Survey in the 1840s. Um, uh, map the depths of San Francisco Bay. And um, on some of their maps, uh, the water depth is 40 feet. But those are just mudflats now. Mm. So really amazing changes in terms of the depth of the bay and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how much sediment got into the bay uh, from uh, the hydraulic mining of the gold rush. And just endless, endless, and the scale of uh, water quality changes over the years. So it's really so many different drivers. And yet, um, the bay, much of the bay is amazingly aesthetic on a beautiful Sunday morning, not bad for a canoe trip so in some parts of the bay. So it's really, really a, um, a, but, but a shifting baseline, and um, but something we're always watching. Chesapeake Bay is very much the same way as is Long Island Sound, where where I, I ended up. Yeah. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk. I really appreciate your staying this long and thanks, guys. Opening this up. If, um, up okay. Um, so really appreciate everybody who's here and um, so many threads to follow in the future. Many. Um, Lakeside chats to come. <laughs> so if you have ideas that you want to share with us that you would like to hear, please do so. And um, we're hoping to uh, have many more Lakeside chats. We're spending this time to share our, our fun and positive memories of the Rotary Nature Center, which is actually 70 years old in 2023, having been uh, founded in, in 1953. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, yeah, I'll start. Um, I first visited um, and first walked into the Nature Center in September 1962, 61 years ago, and uh, met Paul Cavell, uh, Rex Burris, and others, and have a very vivid memory of uh, my first visit there and the next 10 years that I was a very frequent visitor studying the lake. And uh, about 1963 or 1964, Paul very kindly uh, had me uh, uh, come in as one of the lecturers in the summer program. And, uh, uh, and he would send out, I don't know if any of you have ever seen them. He had a mailing list and he would mail postcards out all over Oakland and uh, inviting people to come to the um, to the nature center for the lecture. I was 14 years old, 15 years old, 16 years old, telling people what I had found. And, and the first couple of times, uh, my mother came, sat in the back of the room so she could begin the clapping. So 
<laughs> I can really picture that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Now, Soki, I know you don't have your hand up, but I'd like to know what, what the Rotary Nature Center means to you. Well, so um, I got introduced to the center by Katie, I'm so used to calling her Ms. Noonan, but Katie, um, when I was in high school. And in that previous picture, I'm pretty sure the tree to the left was one that we went on a field trip to the Nature Center and we planted as a class. Wow. Um, it was very good. And I, and I had my first internship there in 2000, um, 2000, in 2000, cause because I graduated in 2001. And I got the opportunity to work there for, I want to say at least three years, but I want to say maybe closer to four or five. Wow. And I um, was able to earn a summer camp there. I also saw the changes from when I worked there. And now I still bring my son there to hang out with the birds. We used to be able to feed the um, the pelicans there, the comrades. We had like the little um, back area, which we're probably going to get into that where that was where we had the um, freezer with the fish, with the grains and everything that was for the birds. And the um, we ran summer camp there inside the center for kids between the ages of um, six to 11. What else? Um, there was a there's a tree trunk in the front by the bench to the right of the center if you're looking straight at it I have i used to have a pet squirrel there <laughs> it will follow me into the office every single morning come get his peanut and then he'll leave sometimes he'll come and sit on the bench with me when i'm just taking a break and just hang out um yeah but i mean there's lots more that i can remember um but i mean i want someone else to have a turn too since I can keep going. Tony, do you want to tell us what you're doing now at the lake? Sure. Um, I can talk a little bit about not just um, at, in the Nature Center, but around the Nature Center. It's dark in my room. You see, you can turn some lights on. Um, but I would say that uh, when I think about the Nature Center and the area around there, I think about uh, the school that I teach at St. Paul's and how uh, visiting the bird sanctuary has been a hallmark of that area. Um, they do like a, a bird census to figure out mi migratory patterns, learning about uh, anatomy and all the different birds that, that hang out there. So having that bird sanctuary uh, flourish with all the different um, birds there. And the, this is a great picture of that area. The kids to really get excited about different species and having their own species that they research. If you're the black crown night heron or you're like the american coot or you're the like they they actually they own that bird and it's really awesome to even i teach a little bit older grades to know that they've had that experience and they have personal connections with the birds and also with hank and that story um and so i just think of that area as really special uh, for the kids that come through my school um and personally just teaching that whole area, uh, how it's such an amazing resource to learn about um, the important parts of, um, I mean, just why the lake's so important to the city of Oakland, um, not just for us as humans, but for all the animals that that use it, the birds, but even the microorganisms and the fish and the bat rays and all that good stuff. So walking around there is really important to just have students to understand that there, there's a whole ecosystem there that's really important. So that's how I connect to to that whole area is just to make sure that Oakland youth know that Lake Merritt is a fascinating place with lots of science that can be learned. So that's kind of what I think about when I think about this whole area. Thank, thank you, Tony. We have Barbara. somebody, uh, Barbara, thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, Jim. Uh, we went to school together from McChesney on. Do you recognize me? <laughs> Uh, I, I do. I certainly do. Hi, Barbara. Um, my mother worked with Mr. Covell for years um, as, I don't know, secretarial work, even when I was really little. So I don't know how many years he was there, but I spent a lot of time there, even mm -hmm. younger than when you were talking about. But I remember when you discovered an organism 
named after you in Lake Merritt. We were also proud of you at school. Thank you. So nice to see you. Yeah. And by the way, I'm going to the Galapagos next week. So I'm continuing my marine studies. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, where I want to be. Uh, that is wonderful. Um, I want to take a minute here. Is there anybody else with a hand raised? I want to no, I don't see them. So I was a young teacher in 1996 when I um, went, I took a course at Merritt College under um, uh, Charles Ford, and he had um, a section that went out on the lake in the pontoon boats. Actually, he strapped two pontoon boats together. And that was, I was a teacher at Oakland High, just up the thing. And that was such an experience to be able to move around the lake. We did a lot of water quality testing, but we also looked, uh, did some organism sur um, survey as well. And I thought, wow, if I could bring students out and have a class, a floating classroom, that would be so fun. And um, when I actually did, uh, have the opportunity, um, partly through a grant from the California Department of Education, to uh, have a, a student um, field station at Lake Merritt. Um, I came to the Nature Center and talked with uh, the naturalists there. There were um, several of them there. Stephanie was there. Um, there was another naturalist there, and they helped me so much. Um, not only in, in um, giving information about the wildlife, but also in how to help um, young people engage. And if I ever had a problem with a kid, um, Stephanie would say, don't worry, Katie, send them my way and I'll give them something to do. And she always had them doing something positive and coming away with a feeling that they had contributed. And I so valued that attitude in, um, in her. And that really, um, she was on the board of the Environmental Science Academy at Oakland High um, all the time that I was there, never missed a meeting, always had great ideas, and was just a wonderful resource, as were some her predecessors. I never I never met Rex in, in person or um, the other. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say um, it was Nature Center really helped make me an uh, environmental education teacher as opposed to just a classroom teacher. I really appreciated that opportunity. So, I want to add to that. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So you're the reason why I got into environmental science in the first place. And um, in regards to the water quality testing, I remember that was my senior project and it was either, I either won first or second place overall for the school district. And I remember that I left the trophy in the classroom, but I did a whole science project on the water quality of Lake Merritt. Wow. And that's how it all started. And I ended up working there. <laughs> and I did work with Stephanie for a long time and she was a great mentor. And I remember uh, nominating her for um, a mental, mentor award too, and she did one. All right, that's wonderful. So um, Jim Covell had a, he sent one in, he can't be with us tonight, but um, he was saying um, that uh, the Nature Center was a second home in many ways to him, for obvious reasons, he's the um, naturalist there. And as a teen, he was um, there as a volunteer on weekends and during school vacations. and. Uh, there was a whole bunch of junior naturalists that hung around there, helped clean, helped do those kinds of maintenance and beautification jobs, clean the duck pond, um, count the waterfowl, all these, you know, engaging in wonderful things and really leaving a legacy for the future. And so he says that, um, that it was a community there um, of people of all ages, united by their interest in nature that revolved around the Rotary Nature Center and our time there, and that changed our lives. And I want to mention that some of the photos I'm showing are actually were contributed by um, by Jim Covell, and also a number of them were contributed by Rex Burris's family as well. Um, and so um, we have a few more minutes, and we can also continue. It's afterwards. I have um, a couple of, of my students wanted to 
um, say something, but they couldn't be here. Um, see if there anybody's here that I know. Call upon them. Let's see. Okay, I do not see anybody immediately um, that I recognize, but please, if you would like to have the last word here, um, I'm showing photos of that I've collected over the years, some of the activities and things that happened at the Nature Center when I was there. Were they ever able to get that pond working again? Um, well, um, that's something that they're still working on. Because the last time I went there, they asked me because I told them I've cleaned that pond so many times, but I cannot remember how to where we used to turn where we would go to turn the pond on. Uh huh. Because it's been so long. Yeah. Well, I know they switched somewhere on on the ground. Uh huh. I just don't remember where. <laughs> exactly where, right? Well, there are people. Uh, again, this is a place where community uh, bank of knowledge might be might be really helpful as we go forward and um, as we um, we come back from the unfortunate happening of a fire um, at the nature center flat happily and or thankfully uh, it was not a, a complete demolishment of that um, you know that cultural and science and community um, landmark it was we're really glad that that didn't happen but um, while there are many people going back, you know, generations to connect to that place, it has cultural significance as well as science and conservation. I wanted to mention a couple people before we have to go into, before we will go into our talk. So um, the first is, of course, I mentioned um, Rex Burris, um, who was naturalist at the Rotary Nature Center for over 40 years. He won. Um, the John Muir Award. He wrote, he was a photographer, uh, artist, um, wonderful naturalist, um, knew a great deal. I had the privilege of, of having correspondence with him, and though well, I never met him in person, but he was a great guy. He donated the logo that we use for our shirt, and um, he wrote the uh, little placard, I Am Your Park, that we've uh, posted in various places to remind people um, of how wonderful and what a great perspective the park is. And um, lastly, um, we would like to thank and remember Dr. Diane Priestrom, um, who has, was at the lake for a very long time, contributing um, all of her talents. She's a geneticist, scientist, docent, dancer, photographer, and naturalist. Um, she uh, took part in a project um, illustrating the trees of Lake Merritt with this California Center for Natural History. And uh, she's also donated some interpretive um, things to the uh, Oakland Parks and Rec online um, pages for the Nature Center. Um, and throughout, uh, she, she made a significant donation for the purpose of reviving the Interpretive Center uh, for all at Lake Merritt at the Rotary Nature Center. And the one that was envisioned by the founders and um, we are indebted to her and we want to recognize her contribution. Hey, so here we are everyone. Um, we can resume talking. I hope people um, will feel free to, um, to share more either uh, by email to me or, and I can send it out later or in the chat and I can again collate it and send it out to people um, so we can share our, our affection and our memory for the Nature Center.